We're recording. Hi everyone, Sue Carlin here from Fast Company Magazine. And this mystical sky ties in with our very witchy theme. Joining us is author and naturopathic doctor, Dejara Sims, who's going to talk to us about the science behind magic potions and spells. You've now entered Hogwarts Online. A naturopathic doctor is a physician who combines herbal medicine, nutrition, and dietary supplements, along with pharmaceutical drugs, to treat and prevent acute and chronic diseases. Dr. Sims practices at Nourish Medical Center in San Diego, focusing on the treatment of skin diseases, hair loss, and digestive disorders, and is the author of Your Healthiest Life. Before that, she was a medical professor at Bastyr University in San Diego and her alma mater, the, the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona. She also trained in traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, osteopathic manipulation, drug addiction treatment, and minor surgery. After work, she leaves people in stitches doing stand-up and improv around San Diego. So thanks for joining us. And now, potions class is in session. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys because I got a lot of information. And so first we're going to start off with, of course, thanking Sue and Comic-Con for having me. It's amazing to be here and getting to share my world with you. One of the things that's really important to me is talking about herbs to everyone, because I think it's so important that we realize where our medicines come from. But because I am like a cosplayer and I'm totally a geek, I enjoy learning about how herbs interplay with TV and movies. So I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you guys. So this is, I have Newt Will of that, the science behind magic potions and herbs. Let's get started. So Sue told you what a naturopathic doctor is. And so this is what people think I do <laughs> normally when, I come into a room, people are like, oh my gosh, you're a naturopathic doctor, and they think I'm like all about that woo-woo medicine lifestyle, and I'm chanting. Now, mind you, there are some naturopaths that are, but actually what I do is what a regular doctor does. The only difference is I start with uh, diet, lifestyle, and I use herbal medicine and supplements as a first line of treatment, and drugs and surgeries as my second line or last resort. So as far as you know, naturopathic medicine, we do love herbs, but um, I'm not necessarily always chanting and uh, saging everything. So a little bit about the history of herbalism. Uh, as women cared for people, uh, they ended up learning the land. And back in the day, you could use any herbs for helping illnesses. And so what we ended up finding out is that traditional herbs and plants uh, were labeled as demonic because as Christianity came and arise, they were, they were felt like it was really dangerous. And so the roles of women begin changing. So they begin to hide their practice of herbal medicine because they were afraid of being seen as witches and being burned at the stake. And everyone has heard about the Salem witch trials. That stuff happened because of the not understanding the science behind the herbs and thinking that it was demonic when really it was just science that didn't have a place in society at the time. So I of Newt, as, as, as you sir, uh, heard in Macbeth, is a codename for mustard seed, and Will of Bat was codenamed for moss. And so these names were used to hide the ingredients and in potions so they wouldn't be copied by other herbalists. So that was more of a, a witchy thing to do to keep other people from stealing your proprietary potions. So one of my favorite shows is The Magicians. But here's the thing, The Magicians didn't use a lot of herbal medicine because mostly it was the finger tutting and actually saying the spells. But they did have herbalism, which is the study of magical plants and fungi. So just like Josh Overman on The Magicians, I too study natural magic um, with a discipline in herbalism. And so I, I like this quote, you're very grounded, poised to harness the earth's innate power. Don't be surprised if a lot of people start asking you to grow them weed. Because a lot of people ask naturopathic doctors. That's the first thing I get. Oh, so you're a weed doctor? No, no, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't give marijuana. I do not, <laughs> I do not grow it or sell it. Uh, I actually use other herbs that to me are just as helpful and legal. So a lot of people think it's magic, but really it's just science. 
So as all of my Harry Potter fans might know, we had so many potions and this is what inspired this lecture. So one of the first things that Professor Snape says to Harry is tell me what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood. And what you will get is the drought of living death. And so what's in that drought, right? So there's powdered root of asphodel, infusion of wormwood, valerian sprigs, sloth rain, and juice of sepulphorous bean. So the only two things there that aren't really found in nature are the sloth of brain, because I guess you could get a brain from a sloth, but the juice of the sepulphorous bean is a magical bean, but the other ingredients are actually herbs. And so I wanna talk a little bit about those and see if actually you would get a drought of living death. So with wormwood, the scientific name for that is Artemisia absinthium. It's a very warm and bitter plant. And we actually use the entire plant, meaning the leaves, the flowers, and the roots in order to make medicine. It is valued for its ability to stimulate bile and gastric production. And it also eases wind. <laughs> By easing wind, it's, it's for gas, right? Uh, so basically it helps you improve digestion and you can actually expel worms. So if you have some type of like infestation, like you ate something bad, like some bad sushi and you're like, oh, and you've seen those like memes or like videos about worms and people, you can actually use wormwood to expel worms. That's how it got its name. And so it actually can also help you start menstrual flow if it's a little late and the bitter oils have been used to prepare actually certain alcoholic beverage so that's where you get the word bitters from a lot of that those bitters that you flavor alcoholic beverages with come from wormwood now asphodel so they powdered asphodel it's an accurate heating and diuretic herb and so diuretic means it causes you to use the bathroom repeat so it's in the lily family and it actually is used topically for lightning freckles um, and it also has used internally for a cough remedy so asphodel is like a lily that we use for cough and valerian one of my favorite herbs i use this a lot with my patients it's actually a sedative and it's used to treat restlessness emotional stress pain insomnia anxiety nervousness hyperactivity disorders cramps and heart palpitations now that's a lot but it's because it's a nervine and it helps calm the nervous system so it does contain a lot of different alkaloids like verily valerate nick acid sorry about the tongue ties <laughs> and gaba and glutamine and different uh, amino acids so if you want to get into the science you can snapshot a picture of that and look those up but those are all the constituents that actually give valerian the power to do the things that it does so what we think <laughs> the herb is is an extract like our uh, drought of living death is an extremely powerful sleeping drought that sends the drinker into the death-like slumber but actually what the <laughs> drought of living death is uh, is a moderately powerful sleeping drought that sends the drinker into a deep sleep while simultaneously pooping out sloth brains and tooting gases from magical beans because really you would just get sleepy and you would fart a lot you wouldn't necessarily die or go into this deep slumber. So <laughs> glad I, <laughs> I like you like, I, I'm glad you like that, Sue. <laughs> I oh. forgot to mute my mouth. <laughs> no, you don't have to mute. It's totally fine. It makes it fun. <laughs> it interacts You're laughing. <laughs> because it actually will just cause you to fart and sleep, not necessarily <laughs> die. <laughs> so the Harry Potter fan lord, a little uh, fan lord, I want to tell a little bit about the Victorian flower language because this has been going around in the Harry Potter crew for a while saying that asphodel meaning, the meanings behind it. So the meaning behind the Victorian flower language, um, just like the doctrine of signatures, which is a doctrine that talks about if you look at a plant, you can actually look at the plant and see what it looks like to learn what it treats. Well, there's also a Victorian flower language. And so it, it gives you uh, not just a better understanding of plants, but it gives you like the plant's personality. So with asphodel, it's a type of lily, meaning my regrets follow you to the grave. And wormwood, it means absence and is often symbolized by bitter sorrow. So combined with the folklore, the fan lore for Harry Potter is, is saying that when Snape said that to, um, when he asked the question to Harry about what would you get if you combine those things, um, it might have meant I bitterly regret Lily's death. As we know, Snape was very much in love uh, with Harry Potter's mom.
So just a little fan fiction for us. One more because I really love Harry Potter. Not one more, actually it's probably like five more Harry Potter plants. <laughs> Cause I think that's just like the mothership of, of potions. So, so what is the difference Potter between monks should and will Spain? And the answer is, as for monks hood and will Spain, they are the same. They are the same plant and they just go by a different name. Um, but I mean, sorry, go by the name of Aconite. And so, Aconite is called the queen of poisons. It was once rubbed on arrows and used when hunting wolves. That's why it's called wolfsbane, because it's the bane of the wolves, because you put the poison, you shoot the arrow, you kill wolves. It's also been uh, thought to actually help to kill werewolves, which we'll talk about a little later. But consuming the plant causes burning in the mouth, followed by increased salivation, vomiting, diarrhea, numbness and tingling of the skin, blood pressure and heart ir irregularities, coma and sometimes death. Just a little bit. This is a queen of poisons and it was used throughout history to kill people. <laughs> so, so this is one of the things that aconite is, is known for, the queen of poisons. Another wonderful plant used in a lot of potions in Harry Potter is called the mandrake. And part of, it's a part of many antidotes and restorative potions. And in one superstition, not just in Harry Potter, it actually was believed, this was really truly believed, that people who pull up this root will be condemned to hell and the mandrake root would scream and cry as it was pulled from the ground, killing anyone who heard it. And so as you can see, you have, you have to cover your ears. So in real superstition, what, what would happen is the hunters or the gatherers would go out, they would actually get the root and they would tie a string or rope around it and then tie the root to their dog, I mean the, the rope to their dog, and then they would run away and then call the dog to them so that the dog put, could pull the root out. And so when the dog pulled the root out, the, the thought was it would kill the dog and not you. And then you could go and harvest it because it just needed to take one soul. So it would just take the dog's soul, kill that, and then you would go get the root. And so this is actually how people would harvest mandrake. And so this is what the real mandrake root looks like. And it actually does look like a little person. So it's historically fabled to emit that lethal shriek when you uproot it. And it's a member of the nightshade family. And it contains narcotic and hallucinogenic alkaloids. So you cannot, because it is so poisonous, you cannot ingest it. You can't burn it near you. So even if you burn it, the fumes are toxic and poisonous. So don't touch the roots because that's where the majority of the narcotic substances are. And so you can't touch it. You can't burn it or ingest it. So what the, the interesting thing about most of these potions is that all of this comes from a lot of poisons. So I actually would love to do just a lecture on the poisons because you could do a whole entire <laughs> hour on just poisonous plants and how they are used in storytelling. So another favorite, Game of Thrones. And everyone who watched Game of Thrones knows about Give Him Milk of the Poppy. <laughs> and it Stark dictates medicinal care of Robert Baratheon uh, to Grandmaster Pycelle. And so give the milk of the poppy, give the milk of the poppy. And you kept hearing that over and over in Game of Thrones. And what this is, is the milky fluid that seeps from cuts of unripe poppy seed. So if you look at the picture, that's an unripe poppy seed. You, you cut that and then you scrape off that fluid and then you air dry it to produce what we know as opium. And so legal growing of opium for medicinal, medicinal use only is allowed in India, Turkey, and Australia. And so they make, between the three of them, 2,000 tons of opium every year, and that supplies the entire world with medicine. And so that's what, when you say milk of the poppy, it's they made a milk using that milky fluid, and it actually was opium. And so there's the poppy plant, and it's papaver somniferum. And opium is a powerful narcotic, and it's used to create morphine, codeine, heroin, and oxycodone. So when they're saying milk of the poppy, they're like, get them high so they can take this pain and do the surgery. So in Game of Thrones, it was commonly used as a painkiller and often administered to patients to render them unconscious so they can undergo surgery. So this is how this historically was used, not just in Game of Thrones, but actually everywhere. 
So opium in modern times, what we're looking at is we still use it as an analgesic painkiller. So we still use morphine as a cough suppressant. If you have any cough and you use a cough, a syrup with coating in it, that's what is in it. It's, you're, you're doing that modern milk of the poppy and anti-diarrhea. And so it's a sleep inducer. Um, it's highly addictive and it's actually a controlled substance by the uh, DEA. Now, um, I say anti-diarrhea because what happens is you get constipated. It's like a side effect of using opium. So if someone has diarrhea, they actually can use opium to stop it. But because these are so highly regulated, you, there's so many other herbs that you can use for painkillers and cough suppressants and anti-diarrhea. Like those, there, there are other herbs that you can use that are not controlled substance because these are highly addictive. And we currently have an opiate crisis here in the United States. So it's really important that you guys stay away from those and try to find other herbs to use. Another herb that was used in Game of Thrones was essence of nightshade. Essence of nightshade is dangerous as it is efficacious. And it's such a true statement. A lot of these poisonous herbs, they all started out being great herbs for pain and great herbs for anxiety. But because the margin of use is so small, if you go a little bit over, you'll die in a lot of instances. So it's like, do you want to die for your pain relief? So a lot of times you can just use a different herb. <laughs> So in the Game of Thrones, Essence the Nightshade was actually almost given to Tommen uh, Baratheon by his mother, Circe, to prevent him from being captured during the Battle of uh, the Blackwater. Because during the battle, remember, if any of you watched it, um, if you capture someone that's, that's in line to be king, they're usually tortured or executed. And so in order to save her child from that, she was going to poison him um, with Nightshade. So a little bit about Nightshade. Um, a trope of belladonna, it is called Beautiful Ladies. Uh, and the reason it got that name is because women in Italy and all, uh, women back in the day, they would actually eat it so their eyes could be dilated. So this is a side effect of, of uh, nightshade is that your eyes dilate and it was seen to be so beautiful that women would eat the poisonous berries in order to have their eyes dilated so they could look more beautiful. Uh, and so the chemicals inside, atropine and scopolamine, they actually come from belladonna and have really a lot of medicinal properties. So currently we use nightshade uh, for actually dilating the eye. So if you see the picture, that's what that eye dilation, you see it's regular size and then on um, the right side, you see it's, it, the eyes have gotten bigger. And so that is the dilation that is caused by belladonna. And women would eat it just so their eyes could look like that because they thought it made them beautiful. Um, with doctors, they actually still use atropine in order to dilate your eyes in order to look at it. So when you go to an ophthalmologist or you go to an optometrist and you need your eyes dilated, they are using atropine. They are using nightshade to do that. Same with scopolamine, which is also a constituent of that. It helps prevent nausea and vomiting caused by not motion sickness. So if any of you have gone up in planes and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get like seasick or motion sickness from going out on a boat or they give you scopolamine patches and that's what it is. You're actually using deadly nightshade in small doses as not to kill you. So um, it also can help uh, relax your muscles and regulate heartbeats. Uh, and, and like I said, they use it for pupil exams. Now on to my favorite, the vampires. So I grew up, and I say grew up, watching the Vampire Diaries uh, and the originals, and now they have the legacies. But every time uh, we watch any vampire movie, you have to figure out how are we gonna save ourselves from vampires and what are we gonna do to protect ourselves? And so they have so many plants that they've come up with that are like fabled to be toxic when touched by vampires or cause them to burn or, or to keep you from being compelled by vampires. And the main one we talk about is vervain, which is verbena officinalis. With vervain, it is called herba sacra by the Romans or holy plant because it was actually said to have stopped the bleeding of Jesus's wounds when he was crucified. So that was one of the things that Vervain was known for. And historically, it was worn around the neck as a charm to prevent headaches and to get uh, for, against snake and other venomous bites, as well as for good luck. 
And that this herb actually is so great because it does so much. It actually eliminates headaches, migraines, it stops muscle spasms, diarrhea, and it's anti-inflammatory and can help with uterine cramps. So vervain is this amazing plant that can be used for so many different things and it can help you ward off vampires, <laughs> but not in real life. Or does it? <laughs> One of the other uh, herbs that's used uh, in Vampire Diaries and a lot of vampire movies uh, and TV shows is Sage or Salvia officinalis. Now with Salvia, we use it uh, in a practice called smudging. And smudging is the practice of burning dried plant material to cleanse and purify a space. And it's actually very common and originated in the Native American um, culture. And so they used it for cleansing and purification of places and of themselves. And sage is, sage is actually very anti-inflammatory and when burned can stamp, sterilize the air. So it's not that far off when people say cleansing the air and using sage to get to ward off evil spirits. Well, it actually does ward off bacteria and viruses and other fungus and, and microbes. So Unfortunately, back then when science wasn't understood, it was of course called witchcraft. So even though burning sage was very helpful, especially when you think about all the plagues and sicknesses that went through, and this was before antibiotics, but sage could actually naturally clean the air. And so herbalists use, the, use sage all the time to cleanse the air and to get rid of bacteria. But of course, science misunderstood is labeled as witchcraft. One of the things I do love about sage, and I just I didn't mention the PowerPoint, but it's a very great women's medicine herb. So sage tea has been super helpful for women in alleviating uterine cramps and bloating, and it's just a really great say, um, women's medicine herb. Now, I do want to speak a little bit to the over-harvesting of sage, but because if you don't ethically harvest plants, you will have risk for the plant being depleted, uh, just like at risk animal species. So white sage is actually now at risk um, due to over harvesting in the wild by people actually smudging. There's also some concern with cultural appropriation because it has originated in the native culture and is a part of their religious and uh, cultural practices. Um, there's a lot of contexture there about like, okay, is that okay to do because we're culturally appropriating from someone's religion uh, to just ward off negative energy. So a great compromise for that is smudging is a part of other cultures too, but you can use some alternative herbs for doing that so that you can still have the antimicrobial effect of cleaning the air and still be true to yourself without culturally appropriating or overusing sage so that we no one can enjoy it. So rosemary is really good for smudging cedar, juniper, and any of the mint family. You can also use lemon balm. You can use so many other plants. Wormwood that we talked about before is really good for doing that too. So look for other things to smudge other than sage <laughs> and cleanse your air with some rosemary and it smells just as great. Now on to the witcher. So this is one of my new favorites uh, and so the witcher is seen to be actually drinking a potion before he fights, right? So in that potion, we figured out what was in it by looking at some of the books and Reddit sites and everywhere because all the fans talk about this. So the potion is chiefly made of veratrum, stramonium, hawthorn, and spurge. And actually, I've used several of those herbs in practice, except for the poisonous ones. So we're going to talk about that. So the effects of this potion on the witcher is that he gains full control of his body, he has his senses, his senses are sharpened um, every time he's drinking the potion, right? So here's the effects of the real potion. So we're going to look at the herbs that are actually in that, and we'll talk about what really would happen to the Bridger. Okay, so hellbore, which is Veratrum species, it's an acrid herb, and it's part of the lily family, and we use the root. It causes diaphoresis, which is sweating. Emetic, meaning he's going to vomit. <laughs> Expectorant, meaning it helps you cough up phlegm. Feverfuge means it helps to decrease fevers. It's a narcotic and it's a sedative, so you can sleep and it brings your blood pressure down and that's why we call it a hypotensive. So if an arrow tip actually is put with poison of varachum on it, it is a highly active cardiac poison and actually a purgative too. So they would actually start having heart problems and vomiting. Uh, it's actually a member of the class of 
of compounds called cardiac glycosides, and it is a medicine that is actually used today. So cardiac glycosides, what they do is they actually increase the force of your heart rate um, and increases the rate of contractions. And uh, that is, is something that we actually use those compounds for. So cardiac glycosides, and that's what would happen. Stramonium, also known as Jimson weed is Datura, and it's actually a very poisonous plant. But once again, poisonous plants don't mean they don't have medicinal properties. They just have a low, like, air, there's very little room for error when, <laughs> when trying to use these plants. So the seeds of the plant are the most active, and it's an anti-asthmatic. It relieves pain, um, and then it's anticholinergic. And so what anticholinergic means is similar uh, to the other plants. It can, can cause pupil dilation. You can have dryness of mouth, extreme thirst, uh, dryness of your skin, impaired vision, because when your pupils dilate, you, your vision gets really blurry. You won't be able to pee. So urinary retention, your heart goes rapidly, starts to rapidly beat. You get confusion, restlessness. You can actually have hallucinations when you use Datura and loss of consciousness. So Datura is very poisonous. Hawthorne, one of my favorite heart herbs, is actually called Hawthorne, and you see the berries there, Hawthorne berry, also called Crataegus, and it's a warming plant. It's a part of the rose family and the berries, leaves and flowers are used to make tinctures, which are another name for potions. And so it is actually considered cardioprotective. It contains flavonoids, triterpenic acids, phenocarboxylic acids, and all of this cause you to have antioxidant effects, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-platelet aggregation, meaning your platelets won't come together so you can, uh, won't have blood clots. Uh, vasodilation, meaning makes your veins open up to increase blood flow. Decreases blood pressure. It keeps you from having arrhythmia, so antiarrhythmic, and it causes your lipids or your fats, like high cholesterol. It can actually cause it to go down. I actually use Crataegus in almost every patient with high blood pressure, and it's so safe, and it really does help to lower blood pressure naturally and helps to decrease high cholesterol, and it's a great antioxidant, it decreases inflammation, and it actually tastes pretty good because it's berries. So Hawthorne is really cardioprotective. Now Spurge, called euphor euphorbia. Um, it's actually a sap that comes from the plant that they use. And topically, it's used mostly for warts and wingworm and to treat corns on your toes, right? So you can actually use the plant though for asthma, and it's an antispasmodic as well as an expectorant, meaning it helps you cough up phlegm. It keeps your, your um, so that people with asthma are actually able to breathe clearly. Um, and so it, it reduces phlegm. You can actually put some on your tooth to relieve toothache. You can actually use it for headaches too. It's also used to relieve throat infections and eye infections, and it's fairly safe. So looking at all those things, <laughs> So what would happen to the richer, witcher? Yes, he would have increased heart rate, increased pain relief, increased healing, pupil dilation. So you see his eyes go black. That would actually happen. Heart, but his heart would be protected. So the cool thing about uh, the writers adding in the Crataegus with all of the, like the tour and all the things that actually hurt the heart is that they're like, oh, all these poisons will hurt the heart, but then we'll add in Crataegus, uh, Hawthorne Berry, in order to protect the heart. So you kind of got heart protection, even though your heart is beating rapidly and he's like, his eyes are dilated, his blood flow is increased because remember, he's going to open up his blood vessels, increase the blood flow, increase his respiratory capacity. So because it's anti-asthma, he'll be able to breathe in more, which will be helpful if he needs to run or fight, and actually increase immunity and decrease chance of infection. So those are the real effects of this potion. So there weren't really far off. The science behind this wasn't far off, but you also would die in real life because those, the, the, the plants are just too toxic. <laughs> so even though you have all these things, which what keeps the witcher alive is that this is a magical world and he is special. Don't drink the witcher potion, please. Little boys and girls at home, <laughs> do not drink the witcher potion. Don't try to take it because you will die. It's very toxic. 
Now, on to one of my new favorite shows. Uh, it's been on for a while, but The Outlander. And we know Claire uses a lot of herbs because she was a nurse. And back then, herbs were the main form of medicine. It's only in common recent times that we started extracting constituents from herbs to make pharmaceuticals. So realize that all of the pharmaceuticals or most of the pharmaceuticals that exist now are just parts and pieces of the herbs that have been extracted because this is where we get our medicines from. But what we've learned to do is pull out one part of the plant and amplify it in a lab so that you can have either greater effect or lesser effect and you can control the effects in the lab. From a naturopathic point of view though, what we love to do is use the plants as is because we feel there is an inherent intelligence of eating plants as food and so therefore using the plant as a whole, the body will be able to better use it without the side effects that come with medication. So that's the mindset behind the naturopathic doctor when we use plants. Not that medicines are bad, it's just that we go to the original source. And the original source of that usually will be plants. And as we see with our patients, they have less side effects because the body knows how to break down plants, use what it needs, and, just, like, and get rid of what it doesn't need. So some of the healing plants used by Claire was valerian root, funiculum, symphytum, mintha, which is mint, salix alba, which we use to actually make aspirin, and chelidonium magus. So we're just going to do a few of these, not too many. One of my favorites is fennel. I actually have some here. I should have pulled it down for you, but <laughs> fennel is funiculum vulgare. And when someone overindulged in food while they were... Um, on the outlander, such as eating too much haggis, <laughs> it's just a Scottish favorite, um, they would use a half teaspoon of fiddle seeds in a cup of boiling water for 10 to 15 minutes. And then you drink one cup of fennel tea after each meal. You can actually do a potion or a tincture of fennel and you can actually buy it at health food stores. They have it uh, in liquid form and you can do one dropper full, uh, up to five or so dropper fulls after you eat. It has a sweet taste kind of like licorice. So if you don't like the licorice flavor, you don't want to eat it um, or drink it, but you can put a small amount of water and drink it. And it's usually very sweet and delicious. And it actually helps to calm gas. And so and there's actually a book out, the Outlander Kitchen Cookbook uh, for fans of Scottish cuisine by Chef Diana Gall Baldwin and Teresa Carl Sanders. And they have like the wonderful dish of haggis right there and potatoes. But for some of us, it's a little too rich. So that's when you get fennel so that you won't you know, pass gas all the time. No farting. That's what fiddle's for. Fiddle's for farting, so you can remember that. So the other herb that Claire used a lot of was comfrey, which is called symphytum officinale. Now, this is one of my favorite herbs of someone that does dermatology because it has a lantoin and phenoloic compounds in it. And all of these help to soften the skin and decrease wrinkles and anti-aging. So I use a lot of comfrey in creams and salves for the face and the skin. So therapeutic properties include anti-inflammatory. It actually is pain relieving or analgesic. It helps uh, with scab formation and healing and, uh, so that you don't have scars. And it's anti-exudative, meaning there's no pus or infection. So the thing about comfrey is that it's so soothing for the skin that you can use it on cuts and bruises. And so how Claire used it was whenever there was a fight or Jamie got you know, he got beat up a lot of times, she would put the comfrey on the wound and on the scars and it would help the heal. And the thing about it helping heal is that it helped to decrease scar formation. So I love comfrey for hyperpigmentation, acne scars, all of you kids watching, comfrey is great for putting in creams to help your clear acne on your face. It's really a great herb. Oh, and one of my other faves, I say all my faves, all of these are my faves. <laughs> So in Sabrina, um, the chilling adventures of Sabrina, uh, once again, similar to the magicians, they are not using a lot of herbal medicine in those. Most of their incantations and spells are more words uh, and not necessarily herbs. But uh, one of the things that Sabrina did in the book, and she, she does have it in the series, is like there's a pouch of herbs that she keeps. So going through the books, found, I found out what was in it. So rue and valerian, mint and basil, cure all and save, um, save all and cure every person born. 
So Sabrina said that the Harvey before using a poultice on his wounds. So um, Ruta, which is Rue, so Ruta graviolens is a pain reliever and it actually has been known over years in the magical realm to ward off evil spirits. Uh, Valerian root is also for sleep and it's a pain reliever also. So topically, it's more of a pain reliever. You don't, you don't put valerian on your skin topically and fall asleep. But what you can do is it, because it's a nerve vine, remember it helps with nerve pain. Mintha, which is mint, so spearmint. Um, mintha perpicta is peppermint. So it decreases pain, it actually helps with inflammation and it clears infection. So, and then basil, which is Osimum basilicum, that's the scientific name for basil, it actually treats cuts, wounds, and skin infections. So that was actually all ground up in a pouch that Sabrina carried. And so how do you make a poultice? So say for instance, you're out in the woods <laughs> and you happen to cut yourself. You can actually use a poultice to heal your cuts. And so this is how you would make a poultice. You would take all your dried herbs. So whatever ones you choose, maybe you have comfrey, maybe you have the root of valerian, mintha, and basil. Maybe you decide to keep those. You grind them up in a mortar and pestle, but with Sabrina, she had them ground already in her pouch. And so then you have to combine it with enough liquid to make a paste. Now here's the gross part. <laughs> Most of the poultices that are made are made with spit. So, cause you're out in the woods and you're like, I need water. Now you can use your water for drinking or you can like, you know, spit and, and make a poultice. So that's actually how poultices were made back in the day. Uh, so, but since we're gonna carry water and find a stream, you can actually get the water and mix it to make a paste or at least make it sticky. And then you actually spread thickly over whatever area you want to heal. And then you can cover it with a cloth or some type of bandage if you have it. Or you can tear, you know, we're roughing it. Tear the t-shirt, wrap it around. So that's how you make a poultice. And on the side, you'll see a mortal and pestle so you can see how that's done. Okay, so just some magical love potions. I wanna end with making sure I go through some actual potions that I've seen. So a lot of the magical love potions I've kind of pulled and look, there were so many. So I pulled some of the main ingredients that I would see in a magical love potion and then talk about what we see as someone who uses the herbs every day in regular people. So the magical properties of hibiscus, which is one of the herbs that I saw in a lot of love potions, is that it causes passion lust to attract a partner. Uh, in real life, hibiscus actually can improve blood flow to the heart and decrease restlessness and anxiety. So if you think about passion and lust, um, maybe you're just increasing blood flow so you're not so anxious when you're around the person you love and using hibiscus. And rosemary, it helps you, it has been fabled to help you keep the love you have. But ironically, ro rosemary actually improves blood flow, blood flow to the brain. So, and it strengthens memory. So maybe that is something behind that. Maybe it's that you actually remember that you love the person. <laughs> maybe rosemary helps you remember that you actually love them when they get on your nerves. I don't know. But maybe that's where they got that from because it does increase memory and it does help you to retain information. Rose has actually been said to help you draw love to you. Um, and in real medicine, in science, the scientific, the scientific uh, research behind rose is that it actually is an aphrodisiac um, and it uplifts mood and is a sedative. So it actually calms you, makes you feel a little bit more sexy, a little bit more extra into the person uh, that you're thinking about, makes you ready to go. So maybe there is something to rose being like drawing the love to you because it actually uplifts your mood. And then patchouli, I love the smell of patchouli. Um, patchouli is actually for passion and it's a lusty herb for passionate love. And patchouli also is considered an aphrodisiac and it decreases tension and anxiety. So when we look at these love potions that are you know, created in these magical realms, there is a lot of science behind them actually increasing blood flow, in, increasing your memory. But a lot of that has to do with decreasing the anxiety that you might get when you fall in love and you, you really want to impress someone and you really want them to notice you and you get the jitters every time you see them. Well, these herbs help you to calm down and to think clearly and increase your blood flow and increase your mood. So I can understand why if you gave a love potion to someone, they would make you fall in love. They would fall in love with 
you because they're in a better mood. <laughs> now don't go all around putting hibiscus and rosemary in people's drinks. Um, that is not okay. <laughs> you should naturally want people to fall in love with you, but you can take these herbs for yourself and maybe you'll uplift your mood and then you would just draw amazing people to you. So uh, just here are a few potions that I would like to share uh, because I call them potions and we call them tinctures in naturopathic medicine, but the reality is they're potions. And <laughs> that's why I love naturopathic medicine because I got to be a doctor, but actually like indulge this very childlike side of me that loved, you know, going out into the woods and picking leaves and picking berries and learning about all these magical things and reading about fairies and dwarves and elves and, and vampires and goblins and <laughs> werewolves. Like I love that as a child and even so more so as an adult. And so being able to have like this science behind it and being able to be a naturopathic doctor was like fulfilling this like deep seated childhood dream of mine to still help people and use real science, but actually still have fun. So here are actually a few real life potions that I created for some of my patients. This sleep potion has one of my favorite herbs that we talked about, valerian root, but it also had kava kava, passion flower, which is very calming, skull cap, um, which is also decreases anxiety, and lemon balm that actually decreases anxiety and that jitteriness that you get um, when your mind is thinking too much. So this potion I actually created for a patient who had trouble sleeping, uh, but their mind kept going and they couldn't stop thinking about things. Because when you start creating as a naturopathic doctor, these tinctures for patients, it's not enough to say, oh, I have trouble sleeping. We have to ask them, well, do you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? Is your mind racing or are you just not are you sleepy at all like what are and we ask questions just like any other doctor but we have to get the characterization of the type of sleep that they're having or the lack of sleep what's causing them to have lack of sleep and that helps us pick the herbs that we choose so when i think about lemon balm and skull cap those herbs help uh, calm the chatter in your mind and passion flower comes in very calmly um, and it's just like giving yourself a big hug and so a lot of times when you're feeling lonely, uh, I love passion flower because it feels like uh, you're getting a hug. <laughs> and so, and then kava kava and valerian root are sedatives that help you sleep. So they take one to two, two dropperfuls each night before bed and they're good to go. Now this memory potion I actually created for my medical students. Uh, some of them were getting ready to study for their medical boards and they're just like, oh my gosh, I'm having brain fog and I can't think and I can't do, uh, I'm so overwhelmed. And so I created this memory potion for them. What's in it is rosemary, which we learned earlier helps to increase cerebral circulation, which that, that is the blood flow to your brain. Um, Melissa, the lemon balm, which was mentioned earlier, is very calming for anxiety and anxiousness. But copa is really great for memory. We use that in a lot of Alzheimer's patients. Uh, so is ginkgo, increases blood flow and helps with memory. I use those in my older patients too. And then go to cola, one of my favorite herbs. It's great for memory, it's great for calming, and it's really great on the skin too. Uh, so <laughs> it has a lot of great uh, properties. And so with this memory potion, they would do in the, my medical students, I would dose it five dropper fulls three times a day, which is equivalent to one teaspoon three times a day. And it helps to increase circulation, calm them so that they can focus and study. So this was one of my favorite potions for uh, exhausted graduate level students. <laughs> now, on the flip side of that is a stress potion, which they use too, but this is for those busy entrepreneurs. Um, with the stress potion, we want to calm down a patient, but we also don't want them to fall asleep during the day. And a lot of these herbs for stress are actually for sleep. So things like chamomile, which is very good as a sedative, if you put a little bit of it, you can actually just get a nice calm. And it actually does, it helps, helps with gas and bloating too. So drinking chamomile tea at night has helped a lot of patients with like that glass, gassy, bloated feeling after dinner, and then helps them sleep really well. So one of the other things is remember passion flower, it gives you a big hug, and then a vena sativa, that's just oat, and it's very calming and nutritive, so that's going to give you some minerals and be really calming and good for your body. And then lavender, one of my favorite anti-anxiety herbs, great for anxiety and depression, um, and it's very calming and very um, and mild, and it doesn't 
cause you to fall asleep and it won't interact with a lot of medication. So I love lavender. You see a lot of people using lavender essential oils a lot um, to help them calm down, but I like lavender internally, not as an oil, but as a tincture um, because it helps to decrease stress and it just makes you go, <sighs> And sometimes you just need to take a deep breath. It's like your whole body and mind taking a deep breath. Um, it's not going to be like taking Xanax, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely going to be very calming for you. And rhodiola and astragalus are herbs that help you adapt to stress. That's why they call them adaptogens. Um, they let you handle stress. So even though all this stress of life is coming at you, you'll be able to actually handle that stress if you have rhodiola and astragalus kind of in the background of life. So this is one of those wonderful stress potions that help people adapt to the stress in their life. And I would dose that also at one teaspoon three times a day. Or if you're using the tincture potion bottles, it's three to five dropper fulls three times a day. And so um, thank you. That's it. I just hope that this was helpful to you and that you learned something and that it was fun for you. It, it's very much so fun for me. This is what I do all the time. I, <laughs> I love to help my patients with it, but it's so great to be able to mix uh, two things that I love, which is like movies, TV, and medicine. And so thank you for watching. If you would like to follow me on Instagram, well, you'll learn more herb herbal uh, medicine things and you can ask me more questions, uh, please follow me on Instagram at, at Dr. DJ Sims, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-J Sims. And www.askdrdj.com is my website. So you can purchase some of these herbs if you like. But I really just would love to connect with you. So if they allow comments at the bottom of this, of this video, please comment. Let me know what you've learned. And also let me know if you have any questions and I'll try to get to the, all of them. And if not, you can totally send me messages on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for watching. Sue? Yay! Hi. <laughs> so that was really fascinating. And uh, I was particularly um, intrigued by some of the lore that grew up around some of the herbs, like the yeah. mandrake. Yeah. yeah, as kind of a protective measure you to get people to not touch it with their hands. Yeah. And, um, and most importantly, to realize that Professor Snape was really making gas potions that... <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> it's causing people to fart in their sleep, basically. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, I'll re rewatch um, Harry Potter in a whole new light. So, but I, just, I just wanted to thank everyone for sticking with us to the end. Um, I hope you learned something. And I hope that we get a chance to see you all in San Diego next year, for real. I know. It'll so be thank great. you so much. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Dejara. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.